In 1988, Jeff Reynolds is 24, nearly married to his high school sweetheart, Jenna. And her car was under the carport. Thought nothing of it. And walked in. Noticed the back door had been broken into. And walked in and hollered for her. And I found her. Meanwhile, Mount Vernon officers comb the neighborhood, looking for any trace of a killer. We'd go down the street, and down the alleys, we were looking in trash cans, and we were just basically looking for anything that might have any kind of implications to being involved in this. The neighborhood search turns up nothing. By the end of the year, detectives are unable to charge anyone with the crime, and the case goes cold. In the back of my mind, I was hopeful that I could find something that either was missed or was not available at the time back in 1988. Uh, from the knee area of the left leg of the thermal bottom, has got a stain here, a bigger stain in here, and one here. Up around the crotch area, you've got a stain here, here. And moving down to the right leg area, down past the knee, you got a stain here, 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 and here. Hayes IDs 23 different stains on Jana Reynolds' clothing, all possible sources of DNA. The clothing is sent to a lab for additional testing. We asked for a presumptive test first. We wanted to make sure that the illuminating um, stains that Detective Hayes had detected was uh, seminal fluid. They came back and said, yes, it is seminal fluid. It seems to be not degraded, and we probably can get you a, a profile from that. And uh, within probably two weeks, we had a profile of, uh, of the person who had left the stains on the thermal bottoms and the panties. Jeff Reynolds is eliminated as a source of the seminal fluid, as are several long-standing suspects. With nowhere else to turn, detectives dig into old crime reports, looking for any similar types of attacks. It was the night of October 22nd, and Dina Dahl was alone in her trailer home. Laying on my couch, listening to Bon Jovi, um, trying to go to sleep, and I heard a you know forcible push on my door, and looked up from the couch, and he was standing there. Dina struggled with her attacker. That's when he, you know, pushed me back down on the couch and proceeded to attempt to rape me. Um, after a while, he finally left, and he told me if I told anyone or if I went to the police, he would kill me. Dina filed a report, but no arrest was made. A couple months later, she saw a set of eyes outside her window. I just looked up from doing dishes and saw his eyes, and he was standing there. And I screamed, and I screamed for my husband. And uh, by the time he got out there, he was gone. Dahl called the police, and several squad cars began to patrol the area. As I was driving east on, on Westcott, I saw a black male walking a pretty, pretty good clip, walking down the street at a pretty good pace. And I stopped the car and got out. Uh, approached him, and as I did, I recognized him as, as Joe Tucker, um, asked him what he was doing, and uh, he just told me that he was out for a walk at that time of night. It was a cool evening, and really he should not have been sweating like he was uh, for just out for a walk. Tucker was questioned. At the time, however, detectives could not connect him to the Peeping Tom report, and Tucker was released. A couple months later, Dina Dahl found yet another strange man in her home. Dina was coming from her neighbor's home, which is this trailer right here, and she was coming across to her trailer, which was parked right along this area here. Dina heard uh, the front door open, and she asked who it was. I said, well, I said, who is it? And he said, it's me. And I knew it was him, and I hit the back door. He chased me around, all the way around, down to the road and up into the neighbor's backyard before he caught me. And then he pushed me to the ground. And um, 
attempted to rape me, and the whole time I was just fighting him. I was fighting for my life. The suspect fled on foot as Dahl called police. The investigation, however, went nowhere. A decade later, McElroy reviews the Dina Dahl case and sees an M.O. that closely tracks the attack on Jana Reynolds. Playing a long shot, he asks the crime lab to run the peeping Tom, Joe Tucker, against evidence from the Dahl rape and his unknown profile in the Reynolds case. Tucker proves to be a match in both. Basically, I got a call from the scientist that was working on this. And I remember where I was at. I was, uh, we had a bomb threat called into our high school. We knew what phone it would, pay phone had been called from. And I was dusting the pay phone for prints when I got uh, a call on my cell phone. And uh, basically, basically, Kristen told me that uh, we got a match. McElroy digs into Tucker's personal history and discovers a connection between his suspect and the murder victim. Jenna Reynolds and Joe had worked together um, a few years prior to that at a local fast food establishment here in town. And Jenna only worked there a couple of months. Um, it was the only job she had through high school. She was 16 when she worked there. Uh, Joe Tucker was a cook, and uh, Jenna Reynolds waited on, you know, took orders. And uh, so their paths had crossed. The connection between Tucker and Jenna Reynolds provides McElroy with ample motive for the murder. He puts a call in to Jenna's husband to tell him of the impending arrest. Uh, he called me on the phone and told me that he was going to go make an arrest. They were going after him. And all that hair was enough root material for the lab to do DNA on you. They compared it to the DNA they found uh, on her bedding and clothes. It was a one in 17 trillion match. Said, man, they ain't that many people on the face of the earth. If you noticed his head was down, uh, there was a pause, and uh, I thought that you know he may actually tell us about it there for uh, a few minutes. Somebody got to be playing games, okay? Because y'all are trying to tell me that I murdered a girl that I only knew for a short period of time. He goes back to, to denying it right to the end, he just denies everything. I'm saying I didn't murder nobody, and I truly don't know that girl. Okay, is that your DNA at that house? It shouldn't be. No, but is it? Is it? I don't know. We got his DNA there. We got all this other stuff. I was trying to overwhelm him with, with some evidence here. If you did this, let's talk about it, and let's avoid this having to go in front of a jury, because you're going to lose with the amount of evidence that we have. Let's just talk about it. Joe. Ain't no wiggle room in this one. None. Wouldn't me. It wouldn't me. Okay. You, you won't take your chances with the jury on you damn right, because that was not me. McElroy and Hayes leave the room and give Tucker a chance to think. On closed circuit camera, they watch as their suspect starts to pray. We're watching this from another room, and we're wondering at this point in time, is he really praying? Uh, about this case, or um, but, or is he uh, wondering how many other cases is he going to get tagged with since they have my DNA? We've always thought Joe uh, has done more than uh, one homicide and a couple of rapes. We think that uh, Joe has done many more than that. Tucker's lawyers argued today that Tucker waves extradition, goes back to Illinois and is sent to Menard Prison on a parole violation. While he awaits trial in the Reynolds murder, Tucker finds himself a lawyer. Unfortunately for Tucker, it's of the jailhouse variety. He sought out a, a person in Menard who had a reputation for having legal knowledge, and he asked this person to help him uh, prepare a defense for uh, this case, Jenna Reynolds' case. So he told Joe, well, write down everything you did in this case. So Joe writes down basically how he kills Jenna Reynolds. It's on one page. Tucker's jailhouse lawyer tells Joe one page is insufficient. So Tucker goes back to his cell and writes some more. So Joe goes back and writes several more pages, five or six more pages, even draws a diagram of the house, of Jenna Reynolds' house. 
The jailhouse lawyer takes Tucker's letter and quickly turns into a jailhouse snitch, offering up the handwritten confession to detectives. He showed them to me, and I was a little skeptical at first, but as I read the letters, I seen that, you know, knowing the evidence and knowing the case like I, I knew it, I knew that the person that, written, uh, that wrote these letters probably was the killer. On April 11, 2006, a jury deliberates for less than four hours before finding Joe Tucker guilty of murdering Jenna Reynolds. The only real courtroom trauma, would Tucker ever be eligible for parole, or would he die inside an Illinois jail cell? She was like me. She was terrified. At Joe Tucker's sentencing hearing, the state brings out its star witness, Dina Dahl. You're trying to go to sleep. You wake up, and you realize it's not your husband. And you're blocked in. I mean, you're, there's nowhere to run, really. Um, and the only thing you think about is survival. Um, and maybe just let it get over real quick, and he'll go away. Unfortunately for her, he didn't. Dina Dole has the desired effect on the jury. They return with a sentence of life without parole. Detective Ken McElroy is in the courtroom with the Reynolds family, including Jenna's husband, Jeff. Jeff Reynolds hugged me and I thought he was going to break a rib. And uh, uh, the whole family is very appreciative. It was probably the most rewarding day I've had uh, during my career as a law enforcement officer. It was uh, very rewarding. And uh, overdue. <laughs>